Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Career Conversations, a University of Rochester virtual series developed to help you leverage your existing talents, build new skills, keep up with industry trends, pursue new ideas, yeah. and navigate your personal passion journey. This session is being recorded for future viewings and you can check out previous presentations in the Career Conversations <laughs> webinar library. I'm Becky Lacone, and I work in alumni relations to identify and create professional development programming and resources for the University of Rochester community. Okay, I don't know. Before I introduce no. Emily, I wanted to mention that there is closed captioning available in the navigation bar. Welcome and thank our interpreters, Maria and Sarah, as well as Michelle Camaconte, who is helping with the for the program today. Uh, you're welcome to comment to everyone in the chat box, but if you do have any questions, I encourage you to send them directly to me, Becky Picone, in the private chat. I will read the questions I receive in the chat, as well as some questions that came in with your registrations during the question and answer session after Julie's presentation. If you'd like to ask a question yourself, you can indicate that in your message, and again, I'll invite you to unmute when it's your turn to ask. Please note again that this session is being recorded and will be added to our video library. At this time, I would like to introduce Julie Stoltman, who will be presenting today on embracing and moving through negative self-talk. Hi, Julie. Hello, Becky. As the founder of Reframe Career and Leadership, Julie's a genuine partner who cares about supporting professionals in their journey to clarify what meaningful work means for their lives. She creates the guided space for people in the middle of their careers, however they define it, to ask powerful, introspective questions and articulate their values to create a pathway forward. She offers one-on-one -on -one coaching that's tailored to where you are in your career and is designed to help you figure out what comes next. She also offers group coaching workshop series that are designed to build community among mid-career professionals with shared experiences and goals. Julie earned her bachelor's degree in political science and women's studies from the University I think of Washington. you should maybe sit with me and listen. And she also holds an advanced degree in gender development and globalization from the London School of Economics. Julie, we're so happy to have you with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Becky. I'm going to share my screen, make sure everything's working. Okay. Let's get this going. How's that looking, Becky? It looks great. Yeah, okay. On my end. Yep. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you all for having for coming today. I think it's probably lunch hour for many of you. I'm based out in Seattle, Washington, so I'm just having my coffee and getting my kids off to school. I am excited to be here today <laughs> to talk about one of my favorite topics and something that I see every day in my work. I am the founder of, as Becky said, Reframe Career and Leadership, and we are a coaching and consulting firm specifically for mid to senior level professionals and organizations. Okay, so let's start. Whenever I am working with individuals or with organizations, I start with values. Your personal values or your organizational values are the guardrails. They keep you in line with what is your higher purpose and what is gonna support you to live authentically. So I always like to share my personal values and reframe personal values when we start. So you know where I'm coming from with this presentation. So as you see on the screen, no one is invested in your career as you are because no one is as invested in your life as you are. And I firmly believe that. Because we are one person, we are not work Julie, home Julie, community Julie. Uh, investing in our careers is a fundamental act of care for ourselves, but also for our families and for our wider community. On an individual level, I believe that everyone deserves to thrive at work. I also believe that organizations deliver their missions when people are engaged in their work, when they feel valued, and when they're at their best mentally, physically, and emotionally. And I do this work because at a systematic, systemic level, our world needs more leaders with the tools and mindsets to drive change. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today our mindsets that we 
all have, and they show up differently for us, but the common theme is that they hold us back. And we're gonna talk about some tools to move through. All right, I hope you enjoy this Rochester orientation, yellow jacket checking in with students as they come on campus for the, the check-in. Um, so as Becky said, I'm gonna invite folks to jump in in the chat. I can't see the chat right now as I'm presenting, but I hope you all can sort of connect with one another and just maybe say where you're coming from, where you're calling in from, or joining from rather class year. Um, and I'd love for people to share why they're joining this career conversation today. And the second question on the screen, I'd invite you to think about as I'm presenting. So when I'm talking about negative self-talk or sharing these ideas, I want you to think about what comes up for you when I say negative self-talk. And hopefully that will spur some, some questions and some shares later on. And our objectives today are to introduce this concept of the inner critic, which is negative self-talk. So I wanna talk about the concept of the inner critic as well as the costs. We're gonna learn how to recognize our own inner critic because it's really important to be able to recognize. And then I'm gonna introduce some tools on how to reframe our relationship to that inner critic. And hint, it's not gonna be to try to shut it out or yell at it and say, stop saying bad things about me. Um, and then answering questions. And I always wanna remind people at the start of a presentation like this, that talking about work and talking about self-doubt and our how we talk about ourselves negatively, it's hard and it might feel uncomfortable at times. So I wanna remind you all to take care of yourself during this presentation. And obviously many of you are not on screen, but I hope that you are standing, stretching, having water, or doing what you need to do to stay engaged. All right, so I'm gonna start this presentation with a little introduction of me, um, which also leads into our topic. So there I am with my friends at University of Rochester graduation day, uh, 2006. So I was a double major in college. I was president of Women's Caucus. I was a teaching assistant. I was a resident advisor. I was a Meridian, which is the campus tour guides at admissions. and I loved my time at Rochester. And on the surface, I had all the traits of someone who was high achieving and performing at the top levels. And I did and did enjoy it. But what I didn't recognize at the time is that some of the motivation that was driving me was negative self-talk and self-doubt. I have to get straight A's or I'm never gonna get into college. It pushed me to get straight A's, which is ostensibly a really good thing. But when that comes from a place of fear and disparagement, as much as from curiosity, there's some cost there. And I share this and I share examples that after college, I went on to get a graduate degree in the UK. Um, I went and became a policy analyst for the government equalities office in the UK, which was a dream job that I didn't even know existed. And so my career was on the surface going great. I felt proud, but I also knew that I was still being driven by negative self-talk. So you're not doing enough to get promoted. You're not making as much as your peers were, as your friends who graduated college. You got this expensive just degree and you're still scheduling for other people. So those voices were still there, even though on the surface, things were going really well. And I'm gonna fast forward because my career took me into public policy back in the United States, into the nonprofit world, into organizational development consulting. So I moved to different sectors and to different employers and different sizes of workplaces and still succeeding, but the negative self-talk was still a driver and it was getting louder and it was getting really hard to ignore. And it was coming at cost to my own well-being. 
So I'm going to share my story, but then also I want to share a couple of stories of clients and people I've worked with. And I'm curious if when I share these, if they sound like anyone you might know. So one of the clients that I first worked with was Nicole. And Nicole was a military, or I should say is, she is a military veteran. She has a PhD. She's a Peace Corps alum. She's an associate professor. She's civically involved. She's a parent of a toddler. On the face of it, I looked at her materials, her little bio from a leadership program she was a part of, which is how I connected with her. And I thought, oh my gosh, she's amazing. What could she possibly need coaching around? And she came to me and she said, what am I doing with my life? I'm, I, I have all this and I'm not, I'm not published more and I didn't get tenure and why am I not making a bigger difference in these areas that I care about peace and conflict. She was so hard on herself and it was these themes of not doing enough should be making a bigger impact. I'm going to talk about Monica. Monica was, again, is, I don't know why I'm deceasing these people. Um, she's a senior professional in corporate America, got really high marks. She was even acting in the interim director role when I first talked with her. She was a caregiver for her parents. And so that took up a lot of her emotional time as well. She had a really full life. And then she didn't get the job that she was the interim of. And she came to me and we talked about what was coming up in some of these conversations she had about feedback, performance reviews, debriefing the job interview process. And what she said was, I heard criticism, but all I heard was I'm fat, stupid, and lazy. This is a per performance review. Was her boss saying that she was fat, stupid, and lazy? No, but that's the negative self-talk that she was hearing in that moment. And it showed up there at work. And then finally, I wanna talk about Marina who had a neuroscience background. So she she's a brain scientist, right? She's in the super niche field and she's been with a company for a long time. She's moving different states and her company says, sure, you can move. You're, you'll have to take a pay cut because because we pay less in this state. And she started thinking, yeah, that's, that's probably fair. I should probably do that. And we talked about, she came to me because she wanted to talk about opening her own firm. And she said, oh, I would do that. You know, I'm not ready yet. Maybe in you know, a couple of years. I mean, I, I should probably get an MBA. Um, I don't really know about business. Like I'm not, I'm not trained. So do you hear again, the voice is coming up. I can't do this. I, who am I to be doing this? Um, so I want you, when I'm sharing these stories, the purpose of that is that these are real people that I know and have worked with, but I bet they sound like some people that you also work with. And so how does it feel when you hear a brilliant, hardworking friend or colleague downplay their achievements or express their self-doubt when you know that they are incredible at what they do? And how does it feel when you're, maybe it's your child or your student, doesn't try out for the team or submit the article for review because they don't believe that they're good enough, even though they know it might bring them joy? or personal fulfillment. So I introduced these stories and set this context because negative self-talk is real, it's pervasive, and the costs are really impactful. This voice is so insidious because for some of us at different points in our life, it becomes background noise. We get so used to living with it. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about how we combat that. So I want to introduce the concept of the inner critic. So the inner critic 
based in psychological research that's been done since the 1970s and continuing today, we all have an inner critic. We are hardwired for it. It is an extension of our safety instinct. It's designed to protect us from real or perceived threats. And this is a problem because going after things, whether in our career or our life or our hobbies, if we go after things that we believe will bring us joy or fulfillment and be meaningful, it can often feel really scary to do that. To go after these things that we want, we have to be visible in many cases. And being visible means exposing ourselves to criticism, to rejection, and possibly to failure. And I wanna bring up specifically that for women who we know from social science research face a double bind of having to be both competent and likable, the stakes are really high. And for people who aren't represented, whether as a racial minority in a workplace or having a visible or invisible disability, for example, it's, there's even more pressure if you're the only one trying to be represented in a field, even more pressure to succeed. And that negative self-talk, that inner critic can get even louder. It can take up all the space. So it sounds really counterintuitive, but this inner critic is trying to protect us from external criticism by just shouting as much self-criticism as possible. And you're gonna hear it loudest when you're actually trying to do something that feels outside your comfort zone. So when it feels like you're not ready, that can feel really uncomfortable. I don't know if I'm, I don't really meet all the qualifications for that. So maybe down the line, I'd love to apply for the manager role. Um, I'm not gonna raise my hand in the presentation because I'm, uh, I'm not sure if my question makes sense. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll get the MBA and then I can launch that business, right? They're always, they kind of sound rational. But we're gonna talk more about that. So how to recognize this inner critic? I'm gonna give you some examples and you probably will be able to tell me during the Q&A what things you hear in your brain. So ways to recognize the critical voice is that is a mean voice, harsh and rude. You wouldn't talk about yourself this way, but your inner critic does. The voice is definitive right? It's very binary, black or white. You do this, you will fail. It is not coming from a place of curiosity. Obstensibly, this inner critic is the voice of reason. Well, you don't meet all of the qualifications on this job, so it makes sense that you would not be qualified, right? It's the voice of not yet, Okay, you're, you're not ready yet. You just need a little bit more experience and then you'll be able to go after that. For a lot of people, it's the voice of body perfectionism. Body image is the example that we saw before of my client who fat, stupid, and lazy came up. No one is talking about her body image, but that's the inner critic voice that she heard. To recognize the inner critic, it's often like this hamster wheel. You're gonna hear the same thing over and over. It's like spinning in your brain. It's really persistent, it's repetitive. And what I think is really important to note is that it may take inspiration from critical people in your life. It may be an early childhood memory of a friend saying, don't, I don't wanna play with you. It might be a parent or caregiver. It really just depends. Um, I'm finding a lot of people at one of their first jobs where they've either received negative feedback or had a really unhealthy relationship with a manager. Sometimes those words tend to stick with us as we go through our career. 
And I'm going to throw out this, the voice of you're not good at the technical stuff. That specifically comes up for a lot of women that I work with, because again, the spheres of quantitative, financials, math, those things are associated in these masculine domains. And what we see is that you're not quite good at that is often a trigger for a lot of, a lot of women. And so other ways to think about the inner critic, if you hear things that are focused on problems and not solutions and just fundamentally self-critical voices, that is your inner critic. So how do we usually respond when someone's being harsh, rude, and mean to us? We might say like, just shut up. Just get defensive, get rude right back. We might try to ignore it. Oh God, just go away, just go away, go away. I have to focus on this presentation, go away. We might try to argue with this voice. No, I am qualified because I know the research says that women don't apply for things if we, unless we meet 100% of the, cat, the qualifications, but I'm going to do it anyway. So there, right? And the problem is it doesn't work because again, the inner critic is trying to protect you. It is not trying to be mean for being mean sake. It is genuinely trying to protect you from having to face criticism or fear or anything that could be a, a threat to your well-being. And so I like to think about how not to respond to the inner critic is, you know, am I responding like a toddler? I have a two and a half year old. Or am I responding like a jerk? Does it work when I say to a toddler, stop being mean to me? Does that work? No. If you ignore the jerk, do they go away? No. Um, the final way not to respond to the inner critic is a tricky one because oftentimes if we are feeling like we are not doing enough or we are not good enough, we're kind of beating ourselves up, we want to go out and kind of get that affirmation that we're craving, or we want to go out and get that praise. And I've certainly done this myself. Oh, I'm feeling really nervous about this. I'm not going to be good at this. Let me call three of my friends and tell them that I'm feeling nervous so that they can tell me how wonderful I am. Right. It's always nice to get praise and affirmation from people we love or people who are in our sphere of influence at work. But the problem is it's not sustainable. If every time you heard negative self-talk, you had to go out there and hear three other people tell you how great you were, how much energy and time is that taking away, right? It's really hard. So it's one strategy that people employ, but it's not a long-term one. So you might think at this point, well, you said everybody has this inner critic and you said it's normal and it's part of life. So maybe we just have to live with it. And I always want to talk about what the costs are of not doing something with our inner critic, with this negative self-talk. And for individuals, the costs are we avoid what actually brings us joy or what might bring us joy, right? We don't even take a step to find out because we're stopping ourselves from doing anything at all. And I see that with colleagues. I see it with my clients. The other costs are that we can continue working really hard got to get the straight A's. I got to get the great performance review. I got to be able to get this job, but we might not be working at what we actually care about doing, right? We're also spending a lot of time preparing for tasks, like the things that we know how to do or that are in our comfort zone, but we're not necessarily taking the stretch assignments or speaking up or doing the things 
like taking up space in the world in, in an area we want to be visible, right? And finally, I think it's really important to be clear that when we're driven by negative self-talk, that is stressful. It stress stays in our body. And there's been a lot of research out about the long-term health implications of chronic stress and how that shows up in our body and in our mental health and in our physical health. And when I talk about self-talk, there is this concept or you may all be thinking, well, this is something that I need to work on. It, it's for me. And there is an element of that. But I will say from my perspective, working with organizations, it's, this is really important for the well-being of organizations and their success and longevity. Because when you have disengaged employees, that's not contributing to, any or, to an organization's bottom line. When you have individuals in your company that are holding themselves back because they have this negative self-talk, Think of the creative ideas that they're not sharing. And when we think about, again, the health costs of long-term stress, think about the costs that organizations are facing in terms of healthcare premiums, in terms of benefits. I am increasingly seeing people saying, I took FMLA, I took a leave of absence because it was just too much. These levels of burnout that people are experiencing are really high and they're having actual implications, not just for individuals, but for the organizations as well. And I think it's really important to say that people who already feel less than, who already feel as if they are the other, and let's just say in their workplace, the inner critic, that voice is gonna be amplified. And the cost is that it leads to further silencing of these voices that we actually need to hear to have that diversity of representation and creativity in our organizations and in our world. So I want to pause for a moment and let people kind of integrate some of the materials I just presented. And I, I'd love to just quickly recap. So we've just talked about how the negative self-talk is something we all have. We can think about it as our inner critic, which is there to protect us, but also keeps us stuck. So I want you all to think about, or I hope you're thinking about what do you hear when negative self-talk shows up for you? What are those refrains? Is it, I'm not good enough. I need to learn more. I'm fat, stupid, and lazy. What are the things that you're hearing? Can you start to distinguish them? And I want you also to think about when do you hear it most? When does it get really loud or really kind of spinning around in your head? And how do you respond to it? I'm curious afterwards to hear how people have been responding if you've been responding like the toddler. So let's move on to what I call reframing our relationship to the inner critic. So there is a huge amount of literature and headlines and training programs and workshops and books all about having more self-confidence. How do we get more self-confidence? And I'm here to tell you that the goal is not for you to get more self-confidence. <laughs> The goal is not to have unfailing confidence. And the goal is not to try to shut out everything critical in your brain. The goal is to have an effective, compassionate relationship with that voice. And I want to go a little bit deeper because on this piece about confidence, because the clients that I work with, 
I'm, I want to say almost every single person who comes to either a group workshop, a one-on-one -on -one session, or if I work with them in an organizational capacity, almost a hundred percent of them will put on their, their goals, more confidence. And I always say, well, tell me a little bit more about that. Let's get specific. Well, I, I need to have more, more confidence. And it's really hard for people to get specific on that. And yet it becomes this ultimate piece on the to-do list or on the professional development goals. And the problem is that this puts the onus on an individual to solve a problem at the expense of organizations and institutions considering their role in this issue of confidence. So I'm going to put that there for now, and we'll come back to that. I think that'll come up in our Q&As. So the good stuff, the good news, there are tools we can use to reframe our relationship with negative self-talk. So I'm going to talk about three of them. The first one is notice and name it. So you are not that voice. You are the person aware of that voice. So instead of, oh, I'm freaking out right now. Oh my God, I have this presentation and I'm so nervous. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna be terrible at this. Ah, I'm not freaking out. My inner critic is freaking out right now. My inner critic is really nervous for me. My inner critic is sending me signals that I should be really worried. So we're noticing it and we're naming it. We're separating the I. The second tool is to get curious and compassionate. So, hmm, I'm freaking out right now. Why might I be freaking out? What is my inner critic trying to protect me from? Okay, right, I'm gonna be doing this presentation and people are gonna see, I could trip over my words and someone could think I'm stupid. Okay, I see. My inner critic is trying to protect me from looking stupid, feeling stupid. And with sincerity, we can say to our inner critic, thank you for trying to protect me, but I've got this. I've got this. The third tool is to personify our inner critic. So when you're able to first notice that voice, you hear it, oh, that's my inner critic freaking out. Think about a character that could personify this. So think about how the voice sounds, right? I did this exercise with Nicole from earlier who I shared a story about, and we were thinking about, okay, when you're having these critical voices, what, what's the tone of the voice? She's like, the tone of the voice. And we had to think about it. She had to think about it for a little while. And she's like, well, it's really dismissive. My inner critic will sound really like dismissive and kind of mean and a little haughty. And I was like, okay, does it remind you of anybody? And she thought some more and thought, oh, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like these really mean girls from middle school. And there was this girl named April and she was really like, she was dismissive of me and she was mean and she was really haughty. And so as we talked, Nicole got this exaggerated kind of amplified cartoonish image of Nicole, sorry, of April. So April was the, the middle school girl. And so she would refer in coaching to April. Oof, I was in a meeting with my, you know, uh, director and April was really speaking up. Um, but I, you know, I told her like, thank you. I get that you're trying to protect me, but I've got this, right? So it wasn't just this voice in the back of her head that could get confused with her own voice. It was that pause she was able to recognize, oh, this is April. April's talking. And we had a language to talk about that, right? So instead of this pathologized, 
oh, I'm, I have these horrible voices. It's just me. Why can't I get more confident? It was just the reality is April's in her head. April's trying to protect her. But you know what? She's a grown adult and she can thank April sincerely for what she's trying to do. So as we move towards Q&A time, again, a recap, the inner critic is one voice. It is not the voice. Even though for some people at some times in your life, it's going to feel like it's the only voice, that it is the loudest thing in your head. But I'm here to tell you that it is only one voice. And you probably know on an individual level that it has real costs, but it also does for organizations. So if you're here in a capacity as a people leader or as somebody who um, is a professor or a teacher, you have students, I want you to think about the costs that it has on the people that you work with and how you and your role as an organizational leader might step into this. Um, again, we talked about some ways to respond that are kind of immediate and programmed, but not actually effective. And we talked about how we can't just kill this voice with confidence. And we also talked about some tools that work and I'm curious if any of those resonated with you. So in closing, I wanna say this is a journey. So this type of work, this work of the inner critic is ongoing. It's not a quick fix. I'm not here to say, hey, drop into one of my workshops and we'll do this and you'll be cured. But these are tools that you can come back to and use throughout your life. And I honestly, as you incorporate them in your life, it will become much easier to notice the distinction between the inner critic voice versus your own self-doubt. And again, I always like to say, you know, self-criticism, the greatest harm is that it blocks us from moving forward in our career and in our life. And coaching can draw out this negative self-talk. So if you're interested in learning more about negative self-talk, the impact it has on your own career, or how it impacts the people that you lead in your organization, please reach out. I would love to talk more. And my contact information is there. And um, I'm looking forward now to fielding some questions. Thank you, Julie, so much for your presentation. Uh, it's such an important topic and we really appreciate all of the great information. Um, at this point, uh, time for questions and answers. And I wanna invite everyone um, to send any questions that you have directly to me, Becky Pone in the chat. Any general comments, uh, um, of course, put, feel free to put into the, the general chat to everyone. Um, but I will get us started with our first question. Um, there's a lot of um, questions related to jobs. And the specific question is, uh, for some job listings, the minimum or required qualifications seem like a relatively high bar to clear. And that could be discouraging. For example, I found several jobs categorized on job sites as entry level that require eight or more years of experience. Are there any skills, tips, or tools you recommend when feeling discouraged or struggling to persevere specifically in the context of sifting through job listings and using job sites? Absolutely. Um, what I would say is searching for jobs is an incredibly vulnerable experience. And it requires a good amount of self-compassion, which is not something that we often talk about. And so the first step when you are looking at jobs and feeling discouraged is to give yourself a time block. I am gonna look at jobs for 30 minutes. I am going to print out two job descriptions. I am going to spend time thinking about whether I want to apply to these, what concerns I have, and then I'm gonna write it out, what feels daunting about it. So again, there are several steps when we think about looking at jobs and applying for jobs. And we often take it as one big thing. 
oh, I'm going to look at these jobs and I'm going to apply. But it's really important to break it down into really tiny chunks and then to be okay with just like, I feel really intimidated by this. Like say that out loud. Don't keep it in your head. Write it down. I'm feeling really intimidated. I don't know if I meet all of these things, right? Getting all those insecurities out. And then I would say really tangibly is, yeah, there's going to be a lot of qualifications sometimes. And it requires you to think really creatively around how you may meet those qualifications outside of the example that they're giving on the job description. And that's where looking and thinking about job searching as a collaborative exercise, not a solo exercise is really important. And as an example, when I work with people on moving into new jobs, that question about qualifications comes up. And oftentimes it requires like someone who's curious and supportive and compassionate asking you questions about how you may meet those qualifications because you may not come up with them on your own. So that's a long answer, but I would say breaking things down, giving yourself the time and space, being compassionate with yourself, and then bringing in other people, making it collaborative when you're doing that job search are ways that I tackle it. Well, that's great. Thank you, Julie. Um, we have another question, a couple of questions that just came in in the chat box. Um, how can a supervisor coach an employee in a way that doesn't assume what they are thinking or embarrass the employee? That's such a good question. I really believe that people managers need to model, they need to exercise their leadership through modeling the behavior they want to see. So I'll give an example. I was recently facilitating a retreat for a leadership team. And the executive director was talking about how he wanted to see his employees sharing where they wanted to grow in their careers. And so that's great. And of course you can put that in the employee handbook or talk to them about it in a one-on-one, -on -one. but they're only gonna do it when they see you doing it. And so I encouraged him and he shared during this retreat, he said, I wanna talk about the things I care about professionally. I want to talk about the places I feel vulnerable as a leader. I want to talk about the things that I'm still working on. So in actually being vulnerable and sharing some of his own kind of negative self-talk, he's, he's explicitly giving permission for people to be able to share that if they felt comfortable, right? So again, the psychological safety piece is really important. But one of the ways that people leaders can support their employees is by giving people access to tools that give insights on their self-awareness. So for example, a strength finders assessment, a Myers-Briggs assessment. Are you basically telling your employees, hey, I want you to be able to learn more about yourself and see what might be useful for your own personal development, not just as it relates to the work that we're doing. So I think that's one example of being able to support your employees by modeling that vulnerability, modeling where you have places to grow, and then giving them access to tools that can deepen their own self-awareness. Okay, great. Thanks. We have several, questions, several more questions coming in, so we're going to move on. Um, what should I do if my inner critic is criticizing me for something I did wrong? Like if I made a one-time mistake at work and my inner critic tells me that I'm horrible, is there any tools to manage this? Mm, that's a really good question too. I mean, again, being able to get compassionate. Thank you, inner critic. You're right. I made a mistake. It didn't feel good. Are people perfect? No. Do we all make mistakes? Yes. Can I use this to learn? Yes. All right. Thank you, inner critic, for reminding me that it feels awful to make mistakes, but everyone makes mistakes. Kind of sincere, compassionate, and moving on. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Thanks for that question. I know I can relate to that question too. So I appreciate that, Julie. Um, here's another. Is adding an apology where it isn't necessary an example of negative self-talk? Ooh, very interesting question. Um, adding an apology is definitely something that women tend to do more, the excessive apologizing. Um, I don't know if this example of negative self-talk, I'm thinking about that more as a perfectionism piece, right? So, oh, if I have to be perfect, well, I wasn't perfect, I better apologize. Um, I think it all plays into it. But again, with the noticing, that's where I would say the tool around naming and noticing it. Oh, I'm doing that again. I'm, I'm overly apologizing. Maybe I just take one more pause before I think about how to respond, right? That's one example of using the tool. Okay, great. Um, here's another. I think timing is important in moving up or on to something new. Does the inner critic help with timing? Timing. Let's see. I wish I knew from this person more what they they could tell me a little bit more about that question. Moving on to something new. Yes, there's something to do with timing. But I think you would ask yourself, is there ever a perfect time to do this? That would be my question. Is, is what is the timing protecting you from? Or maybe this person could also add a little bit more detail. Um, okay, we'll, we'll move on. And then if that person would like to um, maybe put a little bit more information to the chat or ask you know, the question in a, a more specific way or anything, then we'll, we'll invite you to do that. And in the meantime, I will, um, this question that came in, with the registration was, I would like to learn some strategies to help support my staff and peers. With negative self-talk, presumably. Negative self -talk. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, honestly, I think you can introduce these three tools. You can share. And, you know, if you want to reach out to me, I can share some resources in terms of articles. Um, but it's useful to introduce these tools. Again, I think that self-awareness is the first piece of it, is the first piece of introducing this idea of negative self-talk. And I really like the Strength Finders assessment by Gallup, which is a really affordable, intuitive, easy way for people managers to be able to say, hey, I want you all to be able to learn more about where you show up best. And again, we're starting from this strengths perspective versus a deficit. And then if we start with strengths, then going into, okay, well, where do you feel less confident and talking a little bit and learning more and getting curious with your staff around where they're feeling challenged and then introducing these tools as a, uh, Hey, I went to this webinar and I learned this and it was really useful for my own personal development as a leader. These tools might be useful for you as well. Mm -hmm. So again, modeling it and offering it to people to learn more. Well, that's great. Thanks. And on that light, um, when it comes to, you know, talking about employees and, and, you know, staff. So would you find that your response would be similar depending on other ages? Because we have another question coming in asking about resources for high school students in high school, mm. is obviously a time with a lot of insecurities and self-doubt. What would you, how would yeah. you approach Honestly, that? these tools can be used for high schoolers. There's no challenge with, in terms of age. This is something where everyone has an inner critic and it shows up at different times in our lives, but it's still there. And so absolutely these tools in terms of noticing it and naming it, getting curious and compassionate, and then trying to personify it can absolutely be used for high schoolers. That's great. And, um, and we have another question that's kind of a little bit more specific to an age range. How would you suggest we combat the negative self-talk when you're experiencing forced retirement and ageism? Mm. That's a great question. I mean, firstly, it, it would still go back to like, what are you hearing? What are the actual voices that you're hearing in your head? Is it, I'm no longer useful. 
I'm, they all forgot about everything I've given them. You've got to get really specific around the, you're, you might be feeling a lot of things, but what's the actual voice? What are the actual phrases that you're hearing being said? Because that's the first step to be able to separate it from the emotions that are associated with the inner critic voice. And again, it's the same thing, getting curious with it. Well, why am I feeling this way? Yeah, because I've put in a lot of time and years to this field or this industry or this company, and I don't feel valued, right? How do you get curious about that? How do you get compassionate with yourself? So I would say it's the same tools, but it is a matter of really trying to parse out what are the phrases that are coming out versus just feeling the emotions associated with a transition. Okay, great. Um, we have a, another question came in um, asking what the reason is behind thinking of the inner critic as a cartoon character. Mm -hmm. the, the reasoning behind that is oftentimes we take it really seriously. This voice can be really loud and mean and like know it all. And if you can start to find some humor in it, right? Oh my gosh, I am being ridiculous. I, like My inner critic is being ridiculous right now. Like, of course I can apply for this job. What's the worst that's gonna happen? I don't get it. Come on, inner critic. I don't need to spin out over this. So that's where the kind of creating a character comes into play. It's again, it's much easier to pop up in your head, this character, and it's easier to separate out again from this spinning loop and pull out this separate voice if it is a character. Mm -hmm. And it works for some people and it doesn't work for others. That makes sense. Um, another person has asked why we even have these inner negative self-talk and how can we eliminate these negative, you know, negative voices? Yeah, you're not going to eliminate them they're always gonna be there in some capacity. Again, it's not about getting rid of anything. It's about reframing our relationship to it. Oh, that critical voice is speaking up again. Hi. Oh, I see you trying to protect me from getting hurt, but it's okay, I've got this, right? We're not trying to eliminate it. We're trying to have it, to be really aware of it and really compassionate with it so that it doesn't stop us from doing the things that we want to do, but it's just one piece of information that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and we did have a, a reply come in after um, the question mm -hmm. about the timing. Mm -hmm. And she was wondering, to clarify a little more, I was wondering if we can be too hasty in some cases when it may be better to wait before making a move or change. So yeah, that's, that's a really helpful clarification. I would say, Again, it's about taking the time to pause and think about, is the voice curious? Is the voice concerned about my own personal growth or is it more concerned about me staying, staying safe? So if it's a question of timing, you can, it's easily enough to convince yourself I need to wait and really think about the objections that are popping up are they more about keeping you safe or are they more about supporting you in the growth and in the goals that you're seeking? So again, it's one piece of information and really trying to think about if the voice is coming out as very binary or very definitive, that's likely your inner critic. If the voice is more about supporting yourself and coming from a place of curiosity, then that's what the information that you want to be able to take in to inform you about whether you need to move or maybe it does make more sense to wait. That's great. Um, we're kind of winding down now. So I think we have time for one more. Um, experiencing, well, negative self-talk is something many of us can relate to. And these are great tools and suggestions. But can you talk a little bit about how to support or respond to friends, family, or coworkers? who regularly use self-deprecating language mm. about themselves when talking to you or that they seem to be in a loop of self-doubt. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so hard. Um, it's, it's so hard to people to hear people that you love um, make those type of comments about themselves. And so generally what I tend to do is just say, um, 
I wouldn't let anybody else talk about you that way. Um, you know, it, it really depends on your situate, your relationship with the person and whether you feel comfortable kind of having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, which might even just start with, I hear you making these remarks about yourself. And I just want you to know that, you know, I think you're incredible. And I hope that you can do that too, um, or that you can believe that too. And again, it's like, it's hard because praise is one way that people seek kind of to alleviate the critical voices they hear. And again, this is where like, if you have a relationship with someone, it doesn't hurt to be able to say, hey, I went to this talk and I learned about this thing called the inner critic and some strategies. It was really cool. And I, it made me think of you. Can I share kind of what I learned? Let's see if that starts a conversation. That's great. Um, I do want to take this last one that came in. Um, can you talk about the connection between negative self-talk and trauma stemming from conscious or unconscious microaggression, mm -hmm. which is marginalization? Yep. Yeah. I mean, negative self-talk, it's not, again, like it's made up that it's not real. Like if you have had, been in traumatic work environments, if you've experienced microaggressions, marginalization, like that is those are real threats to your well-being. So it completely makes sense that your critic is going to be amplified again and trying to protect you from those real emotional feelings and situations. And again, that's a, the tools are still the same, right? It's about separating what is the voice, what it's trying to protect you from, and then thinking about how you respond. So if your inner critic is saying, don't say anything because they are going to call you out. You're the only one in the room that might feel real. And you might say, all right, inner critic, you're right. That, that might happen. How do I want to respond to this? And then taking yourself to a separate place and be able to think about how do I want to be able to feel at the end of this interaction? And you're moving from a place of wanting to grow. And maybe you do need to not raise your hand. And maybe you do need to get out of that situation and find a new role where you're not going to be exposed to that, right? But you want to be doing it from a place of your own personal growth and where you want to be going versus a fear of someone else judging. So I would say, if that helps at all, I would say like, these are very real feelings that people feel. And so again, the negative self-talk is designed to protect you from feeling those feelings the goal is for everyone to be able to thrive where they are. And so that might mean having to employ some strategies in the short term that keep you smaller and less visible if you want to move somewhere else where you know that's for your ultimate longer term health. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Julie, for today. This has just been a great, great program. And, uh, and I want to thank everybody that put questions and comments into the chat. Uh, it was very much appreciated. We all learned from all of your questions. Um, and thank you again for sharing your lunch hour with us. And I want to say that you can find more career resources, such as upcoming programs, our webinar library, our career coaches, including Julie, um, on our alumni career resources website. Michelle's putting the links of those into the chat right now. And you can also find information about the Meliora Collective the University of Rochester platform designed to help you make connections with those in your field and region and people that have similar interests and experiences. And again, Julie is a member of the Meliora Collective. So, and you can also find that link in the chat. Uh, we hope you'll consider join, joining us for future career programs. And we do have a job talk by Headhunter on Tap session this Friday at noon. Um, so please look for that in the upcoming programs. And if you have any questions, always contact us and uh, we would love to hear from you. So I want to thank you again for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you again in the future. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone.